is the title of my talk. Um, it's been a research that uh, I've been working on uh, since I joined uh, NTU. Uh, it's on high Reynolds number turbulent drag reduction by spanwise wall forcing. Um, this is actually a research that has been conducted by this team and I'm a member of this team. So before getting into the topic, I would like to introduce us uh, uh, to everyone. Um, this is a research that was initiated by Intellectual Ventures and it was funded from there, um, which is basically a prominent uh, intellectual property company in the United States, um, especially the department that we were collaborating with was Deep Science Fund, whose vice president is Dr. Brian Holloway, and Dave Boyne was the senior director that was coordinating this research from intellectual venture side. And at the same time, they provided this fantastic uh, machine precision um, engineered actuation test bed um, that later on during the presentation, I explained where does it fit in this research. Um, this is a research that was led by Professor Ivan Marusic from University of Melbourne and Professor Alexander Smith from Princeton University. I was delighted to join this project to progress and lead its computational side, especially in terms of larger dissimulation. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Dilip Chandran, was uh, progressing and, and leading the experimental side alongside Matt Fu and Andrea Zampiron. And as you see in here, they use various um, experimental techniques that I explained. Um, and also, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Daniel Chung. Uh, he was with us during the early stages of this project, provided really valuable comments um, during, the, during the project. And then he provided his DNS solver out of which he built our LES solver. So I'm talking about drag reduction using uh, traveling wave actuation. This is um, a reset, an idea that was sparked by um, Quadrio et al. back in 2000. Uh, nine, and then since then it has been extensively studied. Um, the, the principle is, is, is basically you have the flat surface that you're oscillating in the spanwise direction um, following this sinusoidal motion. In fact, W indicates the spanwise velocity of the actuation. Um, and, 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 this, and this mechanism, obviously the actuation has an amplitude A and, and it has a wavelength lambda following this, this, this function. And, and in fact, what this mechanism does, it basically generates a traveling wave into the flow. Um, now, it has been shown that this, this, this mechanism leads to substantial drag reduction in, in ball bounded turbulent flows up to order of 40%. And, 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 and the standard in order to quantify the drag reduction is they compare an actuated case like this one with a stationary non-actuated surface and then they expose both of them to the same free stream velocity and the fluid properties. And then they measure the wall shear stress over both surfaces. Here I'm actually um, showing one of the uh, results uh, by, by my experimental colleagues that they conducted hot wire anemometry in the turbulent wind tunnel um, at, 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 at friction Reynolds number of 6,000. And this black signal is the wall shear stress over the non-actuated case. And the blue signal is the uh, wall shear stress signal over the actuated one. And as you can see, as a result of this traveling wave, how the wall shear stress has been dropped. And, and in order to quantify the drag reduction, then we take the average of the um, non-actuated shear stress and then the average of the actuated shear stress. And then from there, then we obtain drag reduction, which in this situation, in experiments, by certain set of actuation parameters, then I, they obtain drag reduction of 24%. And if you look at the larger dissimulation results, um, then at, at, at lower friction Reynolds number of 1,000, we obtain drag reduction of 29%. And the nice thing about LES is you can also obtain the, the flow details. So you can see um, when we look at the near wall uh, turbulent structures, as a result of this spanwise wall actuation, it basically disrupts the near wall streaks compared to the non-actuated one. And as a result of the attenuation of the turbulence that manifests itself into the drag reduction. Now, this problem that I'm uh, uh, describing here in a graphic way, if I want to express it in a functional form, then we can say um, that the wall shear stress over the actuated surface is a function of the actuation parameters 
and the wash stress over the non-actuated one and the fluid properties. Now, if we apply dimensional analysis, we can express this function in a more compact way. Then in this situation, then on, on one hand, we have the drag reduction. And on the other hand, we have the actuation parameters in, in, in viscous units, and then the friction Reynolds number uh, based on the friction velocity. Now, this, this, this problem, this multidimensional uh, parameter space has been explored extensively in the past up to friction Reynolds number of 2000. In fact, those list of publications that, uh, that I showed at the beginning, they were um, actually doing a very valuable, amazing research um, on this parameter space up to friction Reynolds number of 2000. But the question for us that motivated us to um, progress this research is, 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 is what happens if we go beyond friction Reynolds number of 2000. Here I'm actually showing one of the studies um, in the past that was quite inspiring uh, to us by Gatti and Quadrio, that they studied this problem at friction Reynolds number of 1000 um, by, by, by fixing the amplitude of oscillation then they sweep over different frequency and, and, and wave numbers using direct numerical simulation. And then this was basically their parameter space. And they calculated the drag reduction over this, this parameter space. And eventually they created this amazing map of drag reduction um, that, that clearly shows how the drag reduction behaves as we change the frequency and wave number of actuation. I'll get back to this map later on during the presentation. Well, like I said, the question for us was what happens if the, the Reynolds number, friction Reynolds number goes beyond 2000. Um, to elaborate more on that, um, here I'm, I'm plotting the drive reduction versus friction Reynolds number. So this gray zone is the known zone, it's the one that has been previously studied. But the question for us was this unknown zone that we wanted to um, um, investigate. Um, in fact, for example, if I look at one DNS data point from the past studies at, at, at certain ag set of actuation parameters, then um, several proposals have been made in the past in terms of prediction of the drag reduction uh, if we fix our actuation parameters as these values and the increased Reynolds number. These are some correlation models or some, uh, some predictions that are derived uh, from the past studies. Um, and, and you can see something in common among all of them is the decreasing trend of the drag reduction um, as we increase Reynolds number um, with this actuation mechanism. So we wanted to ex explore that, and especially from practical perspective, something that was of interest to intellectual ventures was um, what happened, excuse me, uh, I need to go one slide back. Um, uh, from intellectual ventures is, 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 is what happens if the friction Reynolds number goes in the order of 10 to power four or 10 to power five, basically exploring the efficacy of this actuation mechanism at Reynolds number that is close to the one over um, ground or air transport systems. So in order to answer this question, then uh, my, my colleagues in the wind tunnel uh, uh, carried out this amazing uh, experimental campaign. Um, here is actually the video that you see here. Is, is the Melbourne University wind tunnel. Um, looks like there is a, there is a delay in, in the plane. Um, and, and, and here you can see the dimension of the wind tunnel. So it's 21 meters long. And here is the cross-sectional area of the wind tunnel. And this is actually that surface actuation test bed that was uh, designed and manufactured at, at the intellectual ventures. And then it was shipped to the Melbourne wind tunnel and was installed there. Um, to explore that. And, and, and something very nice about this mechanism is you can see um, as, the, as it operates, it can mimic this uh, traveling wave actuation. Um, and, and, and something nice about this, this mechanism is we have the degree of freedom to generate either a downstream traveling wave or an upstream traveling wave. So it, uh, it operates both ways. Um, and then my experimental colleagues were using various measurement techniques, including drag balance, hardware anemometry and particle image velocimetry. Um, alongside the experimental colleagues, I was uh, progressing the computational side by using larger dissimulation. Um, here is one of our flow visualizations for the actuated case. Um, for the LES, we were using a fourth order spatial discretization scheme uh, with fractional step algorithm. Um, for the subgrid scale model, we were using dynamic smogorinsky of Germano et al 
with Lily's improvement. And then uh, the, the configuration was periodic open channel flow. In fact, we arrived at this sort of um, uh, setup after extensive validation studies with the past. And I have to acknowledge the supercomputing centers. Archer 2 is here in the UK. Spartan is in Melbourne, uh, POSI and N NCI are also based in Australia. Um, so once we set up our, our experiments and, and computations, then it was the time to collect the data. And the first uh, set of data that we carried out was we fixed ourselves to this set of actuation parameters, but then we conducted the experiments and simulations at higher Reynolds number. So my experimental colleagues, um, conducted the measurement at friction Reynolds number of 6,000 using drag balance and hot wire anemometry. And, and looks like the data um, falls onto the prediction model based on log loss shift by Gatian quadrant. And later on, uh, we conducted LES by sweeping over from friction Reynolds number of 1,000 up to 6,000. And then we obtained these data points, which was quite impressive for us. So, so by LES, we could get excellent agreement with DNS at R8000. And at the same time at R8000, 6000, we got again very good agreement with the experiments. And also it looks like the data agreed better with the, with the model proposed by Gatti and Quadrio based on log loss sheet. So I would like to progress the rest of my presentation in a question answer way. And the first question that I will pose is, is, is what assumption underlies Gatti and Quadrio's model that we see agreements with the data? So uh, I would like to uh, briefly talk about Gatti and Quadrio's model. And again, I get back to the data. Um, Gatti and Quadrio build their model by making an analogy between what happens over a turbulent flow over a traveling wave and a turbulent flow over a rough surface. Um, here is actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm describing the, the turbulent structures or turbulent eddies over a non-actuated smooth wall. Um, the way how eddies are arranged is near the wall, we have small eddies. And then as we move away from the wall, the eddies grow inside, but all these eddies are attached to the wall. And I would like to get your attention about the coloring that I'm using. So for the near wall eddies, I'm using pink. And for the larger eddies away from the wall, I'm using blue because later on I'm presenting the data in a consistent way. Um, and then for, for a non-actuated configuration, um, People in, 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 in turbulence are quite familiar with that. So the, the mean velocity profile falls onto this universal law of the world, U plus versus Y plus. Um, and, and, and something important from engineering perspective or from drag deduction perspective is, is, is the logarithmic region that starts from a certain Y plus away from the wall that uh, can be described using this functional form, this universal functional form. I know there are debates about the log region and these constants in the wall turbulence community, but here I'm mostly emphasizing about the, the calculation of the drag and drag reduction perspective, which this prediction works well um, for, for, for a non-actuated problem. Um, but when we are having a rough wall turbulent flow, roughness basically disturbs the, uh, the turbulent eddies near the wall, but the, the eddies away from the wall remain untouched. In this situation, then if we look at the mean velocity profile over a rough surface, which is here, then the, the near wall profile has been distorted, but the profile, the log region still preserves its logarithmic shape. And all it happens due to the roughness is there is going to be a downward shift in the log region. So in this situation, then the log region is expressed this way or basically corrected this way for a rough surface that we still have this, uh, universal log region, but then, then we have this downward shift added to the function delta u plus, which is noted as roughness function, and it depends on the roughness geometry that, again, is, is, a, is a big direction in the in, in, in ball turbulence. Now, Gatti and Corbio said that actually when we are dealing with the traveling wave actuation, something similar is happening. This traveling wave basically distorts the turbulent eddies near the wall, but the eddies away from the wall remain untouched. Then in that situation, then if we plot the mean velocity profile over a traveling wave, then the profile is distorted up to the log region, but still the profile preserves its logarithmic shape. But because it's a drag reduction mechanism, it leads to the upward shift in the, in, the, in the log region. In this situation, then the mathematical expression appears this way. We have the universal 
um, function, but then we end up having an additional delta U plus that, that shifts up the, uh, the, the log region. But in this situation, this delta U plus now is a function of only the actuation parameters. And actually, when you're looking at uh, these solid lines, these are actually our LDS calculations at different Reynolds numbers. And you can see they agree quite well with, with Gatti and Quadrio's hypothesis. So as a result of that, we see agreement between, between our data and Gatti and Quadrio's model. But there is something important about the traveling wave that makes it different than a roughness. And that is with the traveling wave actuation, we have a full control over the actuation parameters. In fact, we can, we can basically alter the frequency of actuation, unlike roughness. Um, and, 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 and something that is uh, quite important in, in, in ball turbulence is, and uh, it has been an extensive research uh, being conducted at Melbourne, Princeton, and Caltech, and that is about, about the lifetime of the turbulent eddies in the, uh, in, the, in the ball turbulence. And they basically categorize the eddies into two types, the inner scales and the outer scales. Um, the inner scales have, 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 have time periods in, in viscous units less than 350, whereas the outer scales have, have time period larger than 350. And something important about these set of actuations that we were collecting data was um, when you look at the frequency of actuation, um, its equivalent time period is in viscous units is 140. Basically, this frequency of actuation targets the inner scales because the, the, the period of actuation is falling within this threshold. So in fact, um, in this regime that the traveling wave actuation um, is agreeing with Gatti and Quadrio's model, is, is basically an inner scale actuation where our period of oscillation targets the near wall eddies. But like I said, with this traveling wave, we have a full control over the period of actuation. We are able to actually target the larger eddies away from the wall with larger time scale. So the answer to the first question that I posed about Gatti and Quadrio's assumption is, it, its assumption is inner scale actuation where the period of oscillation is viscous units is less than 350 and that only targets the inner scales near the wall. So the next question is, what happens if the period of actuation is larger than 350 in viscous units? So to answer this question, then we did another set of um, experiments and also larger simulation. And this time we set the period of actuation 630, which is larger than 350. So we were basically targeting the outer scales and here are the data that you see. So these are the LES data, and these are the experimental data. And if we do some sort of linear fitting, then we see an increasing trend in the drag reduction. Now that was quite interesting for us, unlike Gatti and Quadrio's prediction. Um, and, and, and in order to um, sort of interpret that physically, um, when we look at the, the, the flow visualizations at friction Reynolds number of thousand using LES, um, so here I'm, I'm showing the near wall um, turbulent uh, uh, structures or, or, or fluctuations for the inner scale actuation for this data point. Here I'm showing the, the turbulent structures near the wall for, for, for the new data after scale actuation near the wall. And here's a non-actuated one. So we can see for the inner scale actuation, um, because it targets the inner scales, we can see how the eddies have been disrupted. And as a result, we get substantial drag reduction. Whereas in this situation at this Reynolds number with outer scale actuation, because the frequency of actuation does not match the inner scales, you can see the near wall eddies uh, have, have structure similar to the non-actuated one. They still have this streaky like structure and all they do, they just meander following the traveling wave motion. Um, and in order to make sure that uh, the, the, we had enough confidence about, about this, 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 this result, we tried another set of actuations, again, using um, um, outer scale actuation. Again, the period was larger than 350. And again, we saw the increasing trend in the drag reduction. So the, in the inner scale actuation, as I said, because of the period of actuation, the, 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 the eddies near the wall in the inner scale were distorted. Um, whereas for the outer scale actuation, basically these data points, we were targeting the eddies away from the wall, basically the blue eddies in here. Now, 
How can we explain the decreasing drug reduction trends with inner scale actuation and the increasing trend with the outer scale? Um, this has been explored um, extensively um, in the past at the University of Melbourne. And, and, and from the results, they find that when, when Reynolds number is low, most of the contribution to the turbulence production and drag comes from the near wall eddies in the, in the, in the inner region. In fact, this, this, this region that I'm shading. Whereas as we increase the, the, the Reynolds number, we gradually see the contribution of the eddies in the outer region, in the log region and beyond keeps increasing in the turbulence production and the drag. And here comes a point when Reynolds number goes so high that the contribution of the eddies in the log region and beyond outweighs the contribution of the eddies near the wall in the, in the turbulence production and, 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 and the drag. And, and, and this is actually a graph from the, the, the paper by Marujic et al. that explains that in this, in this plot, that this is basically the contribution to the bulk production. And, and, and you can see when Reynolds number is low in the order of thousand or something, uh, most of the contribution comes from the eddies near the wall, whereas the eddies in the log region have almost no contribution. But as we increase Reynolds number, then the contribution of the near wall eddies decreases, but the contribution of the eddies in the log region actually increases. And actually the crossover happens at friction Reynolds number in the order of 5,000, 6,000. Um, so when you're dealing with the inner scale actuation, because we are targeting the, the, the near wall eddies, at low, low Reynolds number, they contribute significantly to the drag and we see um, substantial drag reduction. But as we increase Reynolds number, because their contribution keeps decreasing, then we see this decreasing trend in the drag reduction. On the other hand, in the outer scale actuation, when their Reynolds number is low, the eddies that we are actuating, they do not contribute significantly to the drag. And as a result, we see drag reduction of almost zero at R8000. But when they increase uh, Reynolds number, then the contribution of the actuated eddies becomes significant. And in that situation, then we achieve increasing or, or, or significant drag reduction. So the answer to the next question is if we target the outer eddies, then on log Yatian Quadrio's model, we see an increasing trend in the drag reduction. And that is because of the increasing contribution of the eddies in the, in the log region and beyond to the drag. Now, the next part of my presentation um, is, is related to the inner scale actuation using larger dissimulation. Um, in fact, I, I started with this question of, even if you are in the inner scale actuation, even if you are only targeting the near wall eddies, is the physics going to be similar to, to the turbulent flow over rough surface? Um, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back to this uh, uh, cartoon that I presented earlier that here is the turbulent flow over roughness. Here is the turbulent flow over traveling weight. And, and, is, and here we see the analogy between them. And, and, and the question is, is, does this analogy stays for any other actuation parameter? In fact, we arrived at this question when we were doing a revalidation at lower Reynolds number for, for, for LDS. So I'm just gonna focus on um, Reynolds number of thousand uh, what I'm presenting in here is just these set of actuation parameters. And you can see um, it's kind of is consistent with, with this uh, sort of analogy with the roughness. And then we have this, this log region that starts from Y plus of about 50 or 60. And actually these set of actuations, if I want to locate that on this map that I showed earlier, they're falling into here. But like I said, when we were doing validations, we tried many um, actuation parameters to make sure that our LDS is working. And, and, and one of those actuation parameters was this one, which we got this very interesting result. Um, if you look at the, the actuated profile, which is the solid line, you can see the profile has been substantially distorted. Um, and in fact, the log region, uh, the beginning of the log region has been extended farther away from the wall from about Y plus of 200, which is, Highly unlikely that you can see such a really highly protrusive level of actuation with the rough wall turbulent flow. Um, and in fact, uh, we found it true like this, this highly protrusive um, and actuation mechanism is rooted in this uh, flow physics that, that, that appears every time you oscillate the wall. It's known as Stokes layer. So every time that you're oscillating the plane in the spanwise direction, 
we end up generating this stabilizing layer that is noted that Stokes layer that oscillates back and forth, back and forth. And actually, Stokes layer um, plays a really significant role for this actuation mechanism in terms of drag reduction oh, that I talked you. about. Um, so so the, the question was, is the inner scale actuation completely similar with roughness? The answer is not entirely. We basically have a Stokes layer forming over traveling day that is absent over a rough surface. And then here, the next question is, how do we first of all identify the Stokes layer in this problem? And how do we quantify its, its, its level of protrusion? Um, to answer this question, I just focus on one, one set of actuation parameters, like one case that we have. And then I explain how do we identify it through that. So here is the non-actuated case. And here is the actuated case that I'm showing with this blue curve. And here is the mean velocity profile. So as a result of the drag reduction, then we see this upward shift in the log region. Now, when we look at the streamwise uh, velocity fluctuations uh, near the wall at y plus of 10, um, uh, you can see the non-actuated one. We have these streaky-like structures. For the actuated one, as a result of the traveling wave, we end up with the attenuation of the streamwise velocity fluctuation. And this attenuation is, is also clear in the, in the uh, mean square of, 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 of U prime, UW prime. So the blue curve that corresponds to the actuated one, you can see from, from some point, then, then it's departed from the non-actuated one. It has been attenuated. And as a result of this attenuation of the turbulence, then we end up seeing the drag reduction. Now, if we compare the span-wise velocity um, in here, then, then we see quite significant difference. Um, um, the the span-wise velocity field of, of the actuated one uh, near the wall you see this coherent motion of positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. And then it's also superimposed on turbulent fluctuations. So the turbulent motion, uh, sorry, the coherent motion is associated with the Stokes layer. And obviously this, this noisy background represents the background turbulence. And when we look at the profile of, of, of mean squared of, of, of W, then you can see up to a certain distance, it, the actuated profile agrees with the non-actuated one. But as you get close to the wall, then it departs significantly from the non-actuated one. Pay attention that here I'm plotting in log region um, away from the wall. And this peeled off region um, represents basically the Stokes layer that is embedded into the turbulent field. So in order to decompose these two uh, mechanisms from each other, we apply triple decomposition where we separate the original signal into a harmonic side and a stochastic side. Um, the harmonic part is obtained by spanwise and phase averaging the original signal. Um, and then the stochastic part is basically the residual um, of, of, of the um, uh, original signal minus the harmonic one. Now the harmonic side represents basically the Stokes motion and the stochastic part represents the turbulent motion. So if I apply this triple decomposition on this image and this profile, then I obtain this one. So this is basically the, the, the background color represents the turbulent fluctuations. And this wave is basically the Stokes motion that comes out of the, the um, um, uh, spanwise and phase averaging. And you can see this, the original profile has been decomposed into um, the phase average component and, and the stochastic components. Now, from now on, I, 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 I uh, named the phase average component as Stokes layer stress because it's basically representing the amount of stress that Stokes layer is exerting. And obviously the, the, the stochastic component is, is the turbulent stress. So you can see near the wall, like basically at the wall, the, the turbulent stress is almost zero, but the Stokes stress is almost dominant. And as we move away from the wall, then the Stokes uh, stress keeps decreasing and then, and then it dives down towards zero, but then the turbulent stress increases. So we have identified now the Stokes layer and separated that from, from the background turbulence. Now, how do we quantify the protrusion of the Stokes layer? Basically, what I'm saying is how, how, much, how much the turbulent background turbulence senses the level of protrusion by the Stokes layer. Now, every time that we talk about Stokes layer, a default length scale that comes into the mind is the Stokes layer thickness that, that, that uh, corresponds to the Stokes second problem um, by the, the classical uh, laminar solution. 
So if you calculate, and, and it's basically defined as when the Stokes layer stress reaches a small fraction, about 10% of its maximum magnitude at, at the wall. So here on these profiles, I'm basically locating the, 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 the Stokes layer thickness with this cross symbol, as you see in here. And, and, and you can see it's kind of under predict the, the true protrusion of the Stokes layer, especially if you look at, uh, for example, the, the U prime fluctuation, you can see the, the, the fluctuation has been extensively attenuated even farther away from the wall. Uh, whereas the Stokes layer thickness is located marking us for here. Or for example, for again, the span boys uh, stress, you can see it's marking here, whereas it has been departed and there is this portion that is missing. And we think that the root is in the definition of the Stokes layer thickness, because um, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's derived out of the laminar Stokes layer and it's completely missing the background turbulence. Whereas a proper definition for measuring the protrusion is to compare the Stokes layer thickness with the background turbulence. And this is what we propose. So we propose this length scale, L.01, that we defined it at the height where the Stokes, the Stokes stress reaches 1% of the background turbulence. Um, in fact, it's the point where the Stokes uh, stress becomes a really uh, small compared to the background turbulence, uh, to the point that the turbulence doesn't feel the, the presence of the Stokes layer anymore. And, and here I'm marking uh, L, 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 L in here that you can see this, this, this bullet point. And if you look at the other purpose, it, it, it very nicely separates the, the extension of the, um, the, the turbulence attenuation from, from the unattenuated on one. For example, in the, in the U prime fluctuation, it, it falls into here, which is pretty much right at the point where the profile is departed from the non-actuated one. Or, or even in the W profile, you can see it nicely kind of marks the point where again, the profile is departing from the non-actuated one. So we use this measure LLL plus as, as a measure of the Stokes layer protrusion. So in order to uh, uh, identify the Stokes layer, uh, we use this quantity L and we define it at the point where the, the, the Stokes layer stress reaches about 1% of turbulent stress. Now here comes the next question of, now that we, uh, we could quantify the level of protrusion by the Stokes layer, how the protrusion of the Stokes layer related to the drag reduction? In order to answer this question, uh, we carried out uh, uh, basically a massive number of large simulations, about 64 simulations, uh, and, 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 and we generated a map of drag reduction, but this time at friction Reynolds number of 4,000. Um, so here I'm showing Gatti and Quadrio's map. Our parameter space is here that I'm framing. Um, and then uh, these are all, all our LES calculations, all these bullet points. And we cal calculated the drag reduction for all of them. And then we generated um, a new map of drag reduction at friction Reynolds number of 4,000, which you can see the trend is quite similar to uh, lower Reynolds number. Um, we basically, um, when, when omega plus is negative, um, we have uh, drag reduction and then and we have a region where drag reduction drops. And then if we go to positive omega plus, then we fall into the drag increasing range. In fact, if you look at the, the variation of the drag reduction, we notice that the, the drag reduction um, is more sensitive to the change in omega plus compared to K, Kx plus. So in order to uh, explain the relation between the Stokes layer and drag reduction, I just focus on one wave number and I change the frequency, but um, any conclusion that I derive is, is, is pretty much universal to the entire map. Later on, I'll show that. So here I'm just focusing on one wave number and, and, and I, I'm changing the frequency, especially I'm focusing on these um, symbols that I'm indicating in here. So here is the drag reduction versus the frequency. And like I said, as, as, as omega plus changes from negative towards zero, we see an increase in the drag reduction. But then we have this crossover from, from uh, positive drag reduction to basically drag increase um, as we increase uh, omega plus. And if we further increase that, then again, we gain um, drag reduction. Now, what I'm gonna do is, is now I'm going to look at how the profiles of, of velocity and, and, and Stokes layer protrusion evolve as we, as we change the frequency in this direction. 
So here I'm just focusing on omega plus of minus 0.05. That I mean here, basically the blue profiles, which I showed earlier as well. And you can see um, the turbulence is attenuated. And here is the protrusion of the slopes layer. Now, if we change increase omega plus to zero, where we basically uh, obtain higher drag reduction, then you can see um, the level of attenuation in the turbulence is higher. And at the same time, you can see the, the, the slopes layer has been protruded further away from the wall. You can see the slopes layer stress has been extended further away from the wall. So it looks like in this, in this kind of change, um, increasing the Stokes layer protrusion further attenuates turbulence and we achieve higher drag reduction. But then it becomes surprising if I increase the omega plus further, then you can see the, the, the U prime fluctuation is attenuated, that the turbulence has been actuated, and you can see how the Stokes layer has been protruded further away, but it looks like it has a reverse effect on the drag reduction, like, like, like if, 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 if the protrusion is, is, is further too much, then it basically leads to dropping the drag reduction. And if we increase omega plus again further, again, you can see the, the Stokes layer protrusion is quite high and actually it leads to the drag increase. But again, if we increase the frequency further, then again, the Stokes layer protrusion is retarded back to what it was before for the drag reduction. And then you can see again, we gain drag reduction. So, from this trend that I see in the, in the change in the profile, it looks like the protrusion of the Stokes layer up to a certain limit is favorable, but if it goes beyond a certain threshold, then it has a reverse effect on drag reduction. Now, to, to evaluate that, um, what we did, we basically um, calculated this uh, Stokes layer protrusion, this L plus that I presented earlier, for all our simulation cases over this, this, this map, here I'm showing the drag reduction map, but then we also generated a new map of L plus that represents Stokes layer protrusion, and we overlaid onto the drag reduction map, and this is what we got. So the, the contour lines are basically representing the Stokes layer protrusion or L plus, and it clearly um, kind of answered our question. Um, we can see, we can over, uh, generally categorize this entire map into two regions. Um, the, the, the favorable region where L plus is less than 30. And in this region, we achieve um, higher drag reduction by increasing L plus. So in this region, um, increasing the, the, the Stokes layer protrusion leads to increasing drag reduction. So this happens up to L plus of 30. But if L plus goes beyond 30, then we fall into the unfavorable region where the protrusion of the Stokes layer has a reverse effect on the drag reduction. It basically leads to dropping the drag reduction. Um, I can present this data in a different way as well. So again, this is the drag reduction map. And here are our simulation cases that, 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 that we did. And especially, um, I, I, I just marked those kind of uh, simulation cases that fall into the, onto the local maximum drag reduction. And then uh, we plot this curve. It's basically drag reduction versus L plus or Stokes layer protrusion. And again, it, it nicely sort of separates the favorable region from the unfavorable one. Um, in the favorable region, we see uh, the drag reduction increases with L plus up to the optimal value of about 30. That's, and you can see all these um, cases that, that are falling onto the maximum drag reduction their L plus or the protrusion of the Stokes layer is between 20 to 30. That's pretty much the optimal level of pr protrusion by the Stokes layer. But once we go beyond this uh, threshold of 30 or optimum value, then there is a drop in the drag reduction and the Stokes layer has an unfavorable effect on drag reduction. Um, I'm, just, I'm just watching time. I'm, I'm just going to quickly uh, wrap up. But, but 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 why do we see why do we see the favorable role, role of the, the Stokes layer uh, for less than 30 and, and unfavorable for, for larger than 30? To explain that, I just picked two cases. Uh, one favorable case where L plus is less than 30, and an unfavorable case where L plus is larger than 30. And here are the profiles. Um, so when we are, uh, and, and here I'm just comparing these two cases together. So here is the non-actuated case. Um, that I presented earlier. 
Um, and, and here is the favorable case where um, L plus is less than 30. Now in this situation, um, um, you can see the, the near wall streaks have been destructed or basically turbulence has been attenuated near the wall. Um, and, and, and something interesting about the favorable case is if, when I'm shading the Stokes layer protrusion, you can see the attenuation of the turbulence in here. And at the same time, something interesting is when you look at the inner peak of the U prime fluctuation, you can see it has been shifted away from the wall. So it looks like while the Stokes layer is attenuating the turbulence near the wall, it also lifts up the cycle of turbulence generation away from the wall. And as a result, we achieve drag reduction or favorable mechanism. But when it comes into the unfavorable one, then you can see the Stokes layer has reached up to here, but the near wall peak is, is, is quite close to the wall. So it looks like um, when, when the Stokes layer becomes too thick, um, there, there, is a, there is a turbulence penetration or, or, or the cycle of uh, turbulence generation is basically within the Stokes layer. We're basically having, having a turbulence Stokes layer near the wall and the Stokes layer is incapable of attenuating the turbulence near the wall. And also when you look at uh, the near wall flow visualizations, you can see um, how amplified are um, the near wall field compared to the favorable one for, for this, for this, for this uh, unfavorable situation. So overall, to, to uh, answer the last question is how the Stokes layer protrusion is related to the drag reduction. We say, yes, it is. Um, when the Stokes layer protrusion is less than 30 viscous units, it has a favorable effect on the drag reduction. But if it goes beyond 30 viscous units, then it, it has an unfavorable effect and leads to drop in the drag reduction. Um, so this is pretty much the conclusion of, of my seminar. Um, the next slide, uh, I, it, I, I need to express my deep sorrow to, uh, for losing uh, one of our team members. Um, David Wine. Unfortunately, I heard the news last week. Um, Dave, Dave was basically the one who initiated, initiated this research. He, 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 uh, he, was a, he was an amazing guy. Um, he, he was the one that built this amazing network of us. And, and without Dave, I wouldn't be able to uh, present this, 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 this research to you. And at the same time, he, he, he built a connection between me and many other amazing uh, people both in the industry and academia, um, they fought with cancer for two years and unfortunately um, uh, we lost him last week and I, I wish him rest in peace. And uh, thanks very much and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, many thanks for this like very profound research. Uh, like you can ask questions, uh, either just open your mic or you can raise your hand. Uh, and uh, all left in the chat. So if no one asks a question, I, I have many, many questions. Like essentially I'm doing some like public stress reduction with Dr. Yu Zhou here. But like uh, my research level is not reach, uh, reach this one. Uh, essentially I have some na naive question for you. Uh, Amir, like you present your like like say you have like uh, uh oscillating uh like span wise device, uh but like there are many ways like could uh induce like turbulence stress reduction like the micro blowing jets or like the uh, plasma plasma uh, actuator, like why you uh select the uh oscill oscillating uh span wise oscill oscillating actuator at the first place. I mean, like I saw your LES uh, simulation, like many cases, I suppose it's like a very long time simulation. Um, so uh, for, for, for various reasons, from practical reasons, um, I, I would say this was of interest by intellectual ventures, like I said. Um, so um, Dave, um, that I'm showing in here, Dave, they was the one initiated this research. So he was inspired by this uh, numerical work of Gatti and Quadrio. Um, and the reason why uh, it impressed him was because of the substantial drag reduction that it can achieve this mechanism, like 40% like or 30% is, 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 is pretty large. 
Um, and he wanted to build, and this is how intellectual ventures operate as an intellectual property company. They, they just dig through the theories and models and they build uh, a design or invention out of that. And, and eventually um, they deal with investors like they have their own plan. And, 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 and they wanted to build basically an invention out of this, this mechanism. And he reached out to uh, Lex in Princeton and later on to Yvonne uh, in, in Melbourne. And, and that's how we ended up doing this this research, I, I agree with you. There are many other mechanisms for drag reduction and, and some of them uh, achieve actually quite promising drag reduction. But the reason why we focused on this one was predominantly because of intellectual ventures, I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is like, uh, you have a uh, span-wise oscillation, but like when you're presenting the, like also like you mentioned the rough wall, so it's all sort of like modified probably found it here, like, but when you present your results, you still use like the log law plot, which is sort of two dimensional. Uh, so is this like two dimensional profile, like still could be able to like sort of represent the three dimensional topless boundary layer. Uh, also, I have a question um, like, sorry, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, also, I have a question. Like for me, I'm doing uh, problems like control as well, uh, which is like use some sort of a vertex generator to try to reduce drag. But the thing is, like uh, you mentioned, you use hardware and, and measure the uh, wall shear stress. I suppose you measure into the whisker sublayer. But for the modified mm -hmm. turbulence boundary layer, is whisker is whisker sublayer still exist? Like, like sort of like. <laughs> Two questions. One is like it's two dimensional profile still values. Another one is like the uh, how how's the inner layer for the for the modified turbulence boundary layer. Sure. Um. So um, about the two dimensional profile. Um. So the, the these profiles that you see in here. Um. Maybe the maybe the previous one is is a more representative of drag reduction. So this is basically the the statistically averaged uh, profile. Um. Obviously, from earliest, what I was doing, I was taking plane averaging and, 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 and time averaging because, because this traveling wave mechanism, I agree that it's a, it's a three-dimensional sort of mechanism. But eventually, what we are interested in is, is how much drag reduction does it make on basically an, an ensemble or, or a sample surface that you have. So that's why we are taking this, this sort of spatial and time averaging. Um, in, in, in the wind tunnel, my colleagues were doing time averaging the signal that they had. And, and because uh, of uh, the homogeneity that exists in the, in the streamwise and, and spanwise direction and, and versus time, then pretty much our profiles were comparable between LES and, and, and hot wire. Um, about the viscous sublayer, I agree with you. It, it, it was a challenge for, for especially the, the, the hot wire people. Um, that's why you see every time I'm presenting drag reduction, uh, they use both drag balance and hot wire and anemometry. Because something about this traveling wave uh, mechanism, it, it, it sort of thickens the viscous sublayer. And, and, and sometimes it even thinks that in the, in the drag increasing regime. And, and you're right, it, it departs from that, that universal viscous sublayer. Um, but this, this is how LES and, and, and hot wire were complementing each other. So when I was carrying out, the alias, I was also providing the viscous sublayer profiles to them. And from there, they could be able to sort of calibrate the hot wire data as well, in case that they didn't have enough resolution to go closer to the wall. Um, so because what, what we found was that the viscous sublayer was quite Reynolds independent and was, was only depending on the actuation parameter. So the results were again comparable. Yeah, thanks, thanks Amir. Sure. So, uh... Is there any other uh, like is there any other people have uh, other questions? So I saw one people oh, uh, raise your hand. You can just yeah. Hi, hi, Amir. Very a nice presentation. I just have one question. So you showed two profiles of whether disturbing the inner structures or the outer uh, structures, right? And yes. you have a linearly kind of linearly increasing graph for the outer structures. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that 
profile uh, settling down somewhere uh, for the Reynolds number I'm talking about. So uh, you, you achieve a lot of drag reduction, but do you see any mechanism that is going to settle it down um, for increasing Reynolds number? You mean for this, uh, for this? Yeah, clause, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Uh, it's hard to tell <laughs> <my job. laughs> um, it's, 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 it's basically a research that, that is uh, ongoing at the, um, at the University of Melbourne, I know. Um, there is lots going on in here. Um, so obviously I'm using a cartoon way of, uh, of describing what's happening, but, but obviously the, the interaction of the, the inner scales and the outer scales and the, how, they, how they actually uh, appear in the drag is, is, is very, uh, quite challenging sort of area. And, and, and mm -hmm. currently I know my experimental colleagues are digging through the data of, of, of what's happening and out of there they can sort of um, derive some models for the drag reduction without already actuation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but there is this series of works of Marujit, Mathis and Hutchins on amplitude modulation and how the outer scales are actually um, sort of uh, modulating the, the inner scales and how that leads to the drag and, and everything. Um, and, and all these effects, unfortunately, because they happen at extremely high Reynolds number. Um, mm -hmm. I, I noticed uh, when they were doing PIV, it was really challenging to take measurements at that very high Reynolds number. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, LES also, you know, uh, we have a limitation, the maximum RA tau that, that we could achieve was 6,000. And uh, up to that okay. point, still it wasn't high enough to see the outer radio actuation. So yeah, um, yeah. currently um, that needs to be investigated further. Okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, Amir, just, just follow Vishal's question. Like, uh, like you mentioned like the most contributes to the drag in, like from the inner layer and from the outer layer. It's like some like mathematical impression, like you can evaluate the drag, uh, like how, how many from the inner layer or how many from the outer layer. Um, to, the, to the drag directly, uh, not yet, but but to the turbulence production and 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 the spectra of wall shear stress like instantaneous signal, yes, there are. Um, this series of work that has been done, especially um, there was a paper that I cited, I recall earlier um, about the time scales, like this one, uh, Mathis et al., uh, which was the JFN 2013, and the recent one, Chan mm -hmm. Rand et al. Um, they they kind of prescribe some models that that that, that sort of um, uh, parameterizes um, the the effect of different scales to the fluctuating uh, wall shear stress um, based on their lifetime. Uh, if you read those papers, you'll see the models. And actually, this uh, this prediction that you see for the turbulence production is coming out of um, the model in here. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I'll definitely check these papers. Sure. Okay, uh, some other questions? Um, looks like Earl Dowell has a question. Yeah, yes, sure. uh, this, yeah, this is about your actuation. If I understand it correctly, you're <clears throat> moving the wall in the spanwise direction with your traveling wave. Have you considered moving it in the streamwise direction? Or have you considered moving it in the direction transverse to the wall? Have you considered those other kinds of motions as well? Um, not yet, not yet. But 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 we know um, uh, the, the, it is also possible to generate traveling wave with those mechanisms. Um, um, as far as I know, there is a group, um, uh, Jonathan Morrison in 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 Cambridge or Imperial College that. They were, they were looking at this sort of actuation using a different way, basically by, by moving the, the wall up and down rather than, rather than in the span voice direction. And then they could generate a, a traveling wave and eventually drag reduction. But ourselves, no, we've been only focusing on span voice uh, wall actuation. Yeah. Uh... And other questions?
Uh, if no, I think it's about the time as well. So uh, many thanks for everyone for participating in the IBM talk again. And uh, uh, thanks for Amir to give this uh, such a, a enlightened uh, talk here. I'll definitely send an email to like sort of reach Amir again. Uh, okay, thanks yeah. for coming. And uh, I'll like uh, see, see everyone like next week. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for yeah. organizing this seminar. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Amir. I'll just end the seminar. Sure.